Universal Design for Learning. It can help teachers reach all students in a modern classroom. Let's find out how. I'm Laura Bergels, and with me are Scott Smith and Elizabeth Godey. And our special guest presenter today is Dr. Hilary Goldthwaite Fowles. Hilary is a nationally certified assistive technology professional. A consultant and trainer, her focus is Universal Design for Learning. Hillary is the Assistive Technology Specialist for Regional School Unit 21 in Kennebunk, Maine. She is an adjunct faculty member at the University of New England's Graduate Programs in Online Learning, and she's at the University of Maine at Farmington. Her book, One Size Does Not Fit All, Equity, Access, PD, and UDL, it's available on Amazon.com. So welcome, Hillary, and to kick things off, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to start us off with our first question. Could you give us a broad overview of um, UDL? I sure can. So UDL is a framework that involves three guidelines, multiple means of, um, of representation, action and expression, and engagement. And those three guidelines are based in a curricular framework, but they're tied to universal design, which is rooted in architecture. And so when you think about your buildings, and if you look at um, such as cart, you know, cutouts from a sidewalk, and maybe you might access it because you have a baby in a stroller or you have crutches or just that's just the way to go. Somebody who's in a wheelchair or a jazzy or on crutches or, you know, prosthetic devices that you know, that barrier of that curb is there. We've removed that. So in architecture and design, that barrier is already removed. Everybody can access it. It's intended for the few, but is accessible to all, which then reduces the stigma and also reduces separation, you know, the separate feeling of, oh, this is only for me and nobody can use it. You know, it makes it more welcoming and accessible. So think about buildings. When you go into a building, are there a lot of stairs? That's a barrier. Or are they designed with a lot of ramps with intention? Are the elevators prominently displayed or are they accessible? Um, when you look at bathrooms and you see the braille tiles to mark rooms and they're in a place that is accessible to somebody who's blind so they know that that's there for them to access what that information is. Are TVs and bars and restaurants, for example, do they have closed captioning on? Some places don't, well they should, um, that I've been to establishments where there have been people who are deaf and hard of hearing and are watching a, a sports game, but the closed captioning isn't on for them. And that's just wrong. It should just be on anyway. Plus, I can't hear it. It's a noisy environment, and I want to know what's going on. Um, even with buildings, just having that accessibility. So it's designed for the intention is to beyond accommodate. I think it's just that you're inviting, you're welcoming, you're honoring individuals with disabilities, but that everybody is able to do that. There's this illustration that that's a shoveling analogy. It's the front of the school and this custodian is, you know, shoveling the steps and this, there's a student in the corner with, in a wheelchair, he says, but you know, if you shoveled the ramp first, we'd all be able to get in and it wouldn't be, let me shovel the stairs first and then I shovel the ramp. But if you shovel the ramp, we all get in at the same time because me who's in a wheelchair is able to access, I'm not waiting and nobody else has to wait. It's all there. And it's just part of the environment and it's natural. It's not this beacon, boop, 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 this is meant for you, but not meant for you. It's just there. It's just- So what would some of the objections or obstacles to implementing UDL be? It's a huge mindset shift for education because part of the way we've been taught as teachers is very different. I come from a different, from special education, and I've always said the way I was taught to teach as a special educator should be the way everybody teaches, because there's a lot of components to universal design in there where you honor an individual based on where they're at and you take them to where they need to be with strategies and supports that make sense for them. And you invite them to be an active part of the learning process. It's not just me spitting information at you. It is me supporting and guiding you and honoring you and valuing you and respecting you as a learner. Mm -hmm. You're not good. You're not bad. You're not anything. You are here. And my job is to help you develop learner expertise. So the goal is in a UDL 
environment are to develop expert learners based on those three guidelines. So there's an end goal. If you go to guidelines.cast.org, and CAST is a Center for Applied Special Technology in Wakefield, Massachusetts. They do so much unbelievable work around universal design for learning. It's been around for 20, you know, 25 years. This is not something that is, old, that is new or a buzzword. This is something that every school needs to do. And in, in our society today, where we're so kind of disparaged and we're so kind of at each other and it's not a very positive place to be, in my experience, when looking at UDL and when implementing some UDL principles, whether it's one thing, it doesn't have to be this big grandiose thing. It can be one small thing, which maybe maybe I use technology a little bit more, or maybe I offer choices a little bit more, or maybe I look at this one lesson plan and I do a barriers assessment and I find the barriers and then I look at what I can do to support and I just pick one thing and I just go from there and I build momentum because everybody's access and understanding of UDL is going to be different. So some people can be right at the beginning. You know, they just want to dip their toe in. And Luis Perez and Kendra Grant have this great book called Dive Into UDL, and they do this kind of swim analogy. Mm -hmm. You stick your toes in, you get a little foundational knowledge. You kind of wade in a little bit more. You want to get immersed a little bit or you just jump right in and dive deep and you get really immersive in the whole entire process and all of the guidelines and ways to build learner expertise. Le leveraging technology is their kind of asset because technology today is a great barrier removal, especially coming from an assistive technology place. But there's a lot of resistance for teachers sometimes in using that. So maybe, you know, looking at where teachers are at, also and kind of leading you know inviting them to think a little bit differently is important do we feel or, or do you feel um is if it helps the teachers be better teachers or helps the students learn more or is it both i think it's all of the above i also think too when you empower your teachers and give them support to design meaningful learning experiences that meet the needs of all of our learners in my experience i feel that teachers are well-intentioned and have really big hearts. I mean, none of us enter education because we want fame and glory. We enter education because we wanna help and we wanna change lives. I know in my experience, I entered education because I saw kids that struggled and it would bother me to the point that I would get emotional about it because school was easy for me and I wasn't challenged. I mean, I would do the assignment and I'd be done but then there were kids sitting next to me that it took them forever and they'd beat their heads again and they hated school. And yeah. because I love to learn, that would just make me so sad. And then it made me even sadder that they were meant to feel that they were stupid or that they were dumb or that because they had a disability, they didn't belong. And that drove me insane my whole school life. Um, being bullied, being taught that you're not enough that's just wrong on any level, whether it's coming from your peers, your teachers, your parents, it's just wrong. People should be made to feel that they're valued, they're honored, and they're respected. And I firmly believe the UDL framework does that because it proactively addresses that. It honors the learner where they are, but gives you an idea of where the goal is, but allows for the flexible means to get there and actively involves the learner in the process. The experience of teaching and learning is a partnership. It's a relationship. So you have to build relationships and the UDL framework, the guidelines talk about all of that. You know, setting up class expectations versus rules, setting up your learning environment. I mean, sometimes we have these open houses, but our spaces are already made. What if we rethought the open house concept and invited community members, family members, and our learners to come into a setting and say, where would you like the math center to be? Where would you like our literacy? Center? What do you need in this environment to be successful? And how can I help you get there? That's my job as an educator. That should be everybody's job. But also kids may not know that. So we have to teach that. 
And the UDL framework allows for that with those flex, with that flexibility. So offering multiple ways to get to the goal is okay. There's not just one way of doing things. We all have different ways of doing things and that's okay. You know, I remember um, my son is 19 now and his father would get really frustrated because my son would do things in his own way, but they worked and they worked for him. They weren't wrong. And he'd get frustrated. Well, I'm trying to teach him my way of doing things. And I said, that's not going to fly because he has his own way of doing things. Is he doing it right? Yes. But I said, no, but it's not, but it's not about you. It's about him. And it's about honoring him and celebrating him and saying, yep, that's a different way of doing it, but it worked good for you. Hillary, this might be a good time to talk about the 1968 uh, Summer Olympics. It might. Dick Fosbury was, he was like a average to below average high jumper. He came up with a new means of jumping. And it clarifies that the goal is not to jump with a specific method. It's to jump as higher, higher than everybody else. Mm -hmm. His, uh, you know, technique was known as the Fosbury flop. You know, prior to that, there was like a few different methods, but they all you know, had uh, the jumpers going nose first over the, um, uh, the bar, he went back first and he won a gold medal. He wasn't supposed right. to, but he did. And so now that is the standard in jumping. And I thought that, you know, that, you know, I, I thought, well, convergence of goals and means. I mean, that's kind of why I hated certain classes that made me write a lot because I didn't have very good motor skills. Mm -hmm. And I got errors on spelling tests because teachers couldn't read my handwriting. Right. And, I mean, it was a little bit more limited back then, but we have a lot more opportunities for children to use other uh, means of expression other than pen and blue book or what have you, paper. Um, what uh, do you have you know, thoughts on that? Um, what, what are some of the things you could recommend to avoid <laughs> merging it's, goals and means? It's true because and I love that analogy of the thought because look at what he's done and nobody had really thought about it, but look at how successful he was and how that transformed the whole entire practice of long jumping. And it made it more accessible for people who may not even consider long jumping, but maybe I have this way of doing it because I'm passionate about it. So thinking about, you know, you talking about, you know, your written expression and that your handwriting was a barrier. Well, the pen and paper is a barrier because of the motoric stuff. Nowadays, with today's technology, I mean, our phones are assistive technology devices. So when I look at assistive technology as a way to help support the UDL framework, that's very, very powerful. So maybe giving you, for example, instead of writing, what if, you know, you could show it through illustration or, you know, like pictures or give you a device that has access to dictation software so that you actually or dictating your thoughts, you have a cohesive sentence and it takes that spelling and that misspell or that fear of misspelling, that barrier away. Because what's the goal? Is the goal to is is the goal for Scott to show what he knows, or is this goal for Scott to spell 10 words accurately? Depending on that goal is what your means are. So if the goal is for you to spell accurately, well, how do I get you there? You know, do I give you that support of word prediction? that will help you spell more accurately because you see it, you hear it, it's there. Do I give you opportunities to practice that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. And then if it's the goal is to demonstrate knowledge, well, then why not give you access to tools such as dictation, word prediction, a word bank, vocabulary banks, graphic organizers, whether they're on a computer or otherwise, but providing those choices and options and explicitly teaching children as early as kindergarten, how to use these tools and to take the stigma away from, it's just somebody with a disability that can access this, but that it's available for all. I'm not a classroom teacher, but I do corporate training. And you hit a hot button for me because I did a training session about, I don't know, two or three months ago, and it was about slide design. And we were going over um, some slides that people had where they had red text on a green background. And I talked about red, green color blindness and how, uh, so if we, if we take that away, 
it not only helps people who have red green color blindness see what you're saying but it also makes it a lot lovelier for a lot of uh, <laughs> the rest of us who don't have red green color blindness or for photosensitive photosensitive individuals who would be ill if they saw that so designing for people who are at the outer edges of the bell-shaped curve of everybody mm -hmm. makes it better for everyone. You're and absolutely that right. That is your heart of UDL. And even though I don't, I'm not in a classroom setting, I can see the value of this for a lot of different applications beyond a classroom setting. Absolutely. Can you address that a little? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I always talk about UDL in the classroom because that's kind of where I'm at higher ed, but in the business environment, in the work environment, it is so critical to make sure that information is presented, whether it's your training materials, your content in a universally designed format, which means options, choice, and flexibility. So if you're looking at slides in particular, make sure that your text is the right format for one thing. You know, some of those funky fonts are really hard to read for people with visual impairments. Think about that. There are some great resources. Google's great because you can Google accessibility checkers and check to make sure that your content is accessible, whether your slide colors and actually PowerPoint in Microsoft has an accessibility checker that will tell you what's wrong based on color, whether you have alt text for images, and it also will run closed captionings with a transcript as you're presenting. And those things should be put in place as just part of those should just be not things we do after the fact, but those should be things that we are actively teaching and training people to be doing and designing from the outset. Because when we have this bell curve, like you talked about, and there's the myth of average, I like to invite everyone to Google that. There's a great TED talk about the myth of average where most of our curriculum and our experiences, whether it's work related or otherwise are designed here in this bell curve but not here or here. So you got these higher ends that are bored and unmotivated and are just like whatever. And then we have these kids here that it, it, you know, it's just inaccessible because this is where they're at. But if we designed for those outliers and put those strategies and supports in place as a forethought, so for our kind of lower part of the bell curve, you'd have visual supports, you'd have language, you'd use AAC, whatever it is, you know, you might have an employee who's blind, so you make sure that you have a Braille format. You make sure you have closed captionings and, and all your videos. You have a transcript. You put all of that first and foremost. Your training is in Word, not PDF, because that's so inaccessible. That's a whole other topic. Um, and then you're challenging, you know, you, but you're challenging in different ways. But the goal is, is there. We want you to get here, but the means to get there is flexible. So some of, like, your training materials, do you have videos? If so, yes. Are they closed captioned? Yes. What else do you have? Do you have text like for people to read who like to read and get content that way? Yes. Is that accessible to people with screen readers? Can I use that in Word so that it's, you know, easily converts to Braille so that somebody who requires Braille has it, but I don't have to go outside of here to get the Braille format because if I give it to Word and I email it to a user who has an electronic braille note taker that has email capability, they can read the attachment and it reads in braille. Easy peasy. So literally you're emailing the whole team and you have somebody on your team who, who's blind, they're able to get that in the same format that everybody else is, but it's able to be easily translated into braille because the technology, because you've made that, excuse me, accessible first and foremost with that proactive planning they're able to use their assistive technology um, in order to access that. But that goes even further because sometimes we all use technology for different things. I mean, how many of us use Siri to search for something or Alexa or Hey Google? How many of us, you know, use word typing prediction when we're typing on our phone or texting on our phones? How many of us use text to speech to proofread our evaluations? How many of us use a spelling and grammar checker? This is precisely true. I have uh, team members who are visually impaired and blind, and they don't know Braille, but they do rely rather heavily on Siri and OK Google and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and making sure those file formats are and a lot of curriculum this is so frustrating for me a lot of mat materials and training materials are in pdf format which i understand the why because we want to keep it secure but if we are flexible then we're able to easily update it because it's not static it's dynamic and so is our curriculum curriculum should be dynamic our training materials need to be dynamic because everything's constantly changing and if we have this flexibility in this framework that's flexible as well then guess what it winds up being easier it's a mindset shift that we have not been trained as educators to do or no one be able to do but we need to be so if we're looking at teacher training program or even workforce training programs we need to be training everybody to be a universally designed specialist to have some training and expertise around universal design around accessibility around designing for the edges tell us uh, our listeners and our watchers just a little bit more about what we can do to connect with you well you can find me on the twitter as as we say um i'm hillary gf phd atp and i post a lot about universal design assistive technology um I write from my blog, which is HillaryHelpsYouLearn.com, where I offer some resources and training um, and support around the concepts of assistive technology, universal design for learning, and accessible educational materials, not just in K-12, but higher ed and, and in workforce training as well. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm Hillary Goldthwaite Fowles. It's pretty easy to find. If you like pictures of sunsets, um, you can follow me on Instagram because I like sunsets. It's kind of my thing.